we um, we were invited uh, to come this weekend to contribute something uh, to to bring kind of something of our story to you guys. Uh, but to be um, quite frank, we feel like we have received a lot from you guys. Uh, we feel like you guys have been the gift to us. Um, so we are very, very grateful that you asked us to come um, and that um, you guys have all been here in a way that have opened up your lives. Uh, and I think we have all come away uh, learning something about each other and about the calling to which we are to live. So thank you. Uh, very soon um, we'll be invited to take part uh, in a ritual uh, that is likely to be all too familiar um, for many of us, whether we call it the Eucharist, communion, table fellowship, or simply a shared meal, this practice of sharing bread and wine, juice, is possibly the oldest and most native to the Christian faith. So my task this morning is to offer a very, very short reflection on why the church has often viewed this practice of the Eucharist as its primary witness to reconciliation in the world. How is it that this meal expresses a way of being in the world where divisions in the human community be can be transformed? But rather than showing an ideal example of where this is so, I want to begin with the congregation's malpractice of this meal. In Paul's letter to the first Corinthians, we observe the following. The practice of the Lord's Supper was actually a substantial feast hosted by one of the wealthier members of the congregation. The individual guests, us, were invited to contribute their own offering to this meal. So it was more like a potluck than a set buffet. As was the custom, the meal would have been followed by conversation and possibly entertainment. Who knows what's coming later. However, a number of things were going wrong in this community's practice of this meal. It appears that the wealthier members had grown tired and hungry of waiting for the poorer members to arrive, who would have worked longer hours. And so, the host Hello. began serving the feast before all members were present, which meant that the food and wine were being distributed unevenly. You've come to join us. Yes. <laughs> Some of the members, the rich, were going away drunk, while others, the poor, left hungry. So Paul castigates the Corinthians for allowing their factionalism and divisions to become a source of injustice towards the poor and weak. He tells them that their gatherings are not really the Lord's Supper they eat because they have failed to discern the body. So what does it mean then to discern the body? Well, I think at least two meanings might be present here. First, the body refers to the Christian community, the body of Christ, which was meant to exist as a sign of God's reconciliation in bringing together rich and poor, slaves and free, women as well as men. By excluding some of their own members from full table fellowship on the basis of wealth or power, the Corinthians were failing to be the kind of community to which they were called. Instead of being a new creation in Christ, they were simply reflecting the priorities and behaviours of their own native pagan culture. Second, the body refers also to God's Messiah, Jesus, who practised a radically different set of table manners. As one author puts it, the table companionship practised by Jesus thus recreated the world. It redrew all of society's maps and flowcharts. Instead of symbolizing social rank and order, it blurred the distinction between hosts and guests, need and plenty. Instead of reinforcing rules of etiquette, it subverted them, making the last first and the first last. The meal was to be practiced in a way that Jesus would be remembered. 
The story of God's choosing the weak and despised of the world to shame the strong by honouring the weaker member, giving them pride of place at the table. And choosing to side with the outcast was to be reflected throughout the church's liturgical life. The Corinthians had forgotten their foundational narrative and had allowed their gatherings to degenerate into private dinner parties. Likewise, what followed the meal in Corinth failed to reflect true worship. According to Greek custom, after the dishes were cleared, a libation or toast would be given before each, each invited guest would be um, asked to contribute to conversation and entertainment. Now, Paul thought this practice had great potential to reinforce the common life of the community as each member shared their spiritual gift for building up the body. Sadly, however, the post-meal activities of the Corinthians only further reinforced their divisions. Rather than seeing the range of gifts in the community as mutually dependent on each other for generating genuine communion, some Corinthians had allowed their gifts to heighten their singularity an exceptional role in the church. They acted as spiritual elitists, setting up a hierarchy in which some members were no longer valued on account of their unimpressive spiritual prowess. Paul attacks such prideful individualism at its root by insisting that those ruled by the age of the spirit must think in terms of the common good looking to the good of others on account of sharing in a more profound unity. In an unmistakably Trinitarian tone, he writes, there is a variety of gifts, but one spirit, a variety of services, but one Lord, a variety of activities, but one God who activates them all in all. For Paul, the church's unity was constitutive of its sharing in the life of Christ. The Corinthians were expected to embody this unity by valuing each person equally in the light of the Spirit's presence in their life. It is at this point that Paul employs his distinctive metaphor of the body of Christ. He reminds the Corinthians of their baptism into Christ's reconciled body, which extends to the division between weak and strong, honourable and less respected, and tells them that dissension along these lines is tantamount to a rejection of Christ himself. Finally, he instructs the Corinthians to practice a mutuality of care, such that solidarity in suffering and rejoicing become the telos of this community's reconciled life together. I think Paul's response is quite interesting. For when he talks about the acts of baptism and Eucharistic fellowship, he does not urge the Corinthians to realize the ideal of reconciliation through a better performance of the sacraments, which would suggest that reconciliation is a goal attained via the church's perfection of certain habits. Rather, Paul's appeal is for the Corinthians to recognize their common reconciliation as a given reality, a reality that they already participate in as the body of Christ. The issue for the Corinthians, as it is for the church today, is whether or not they are living in a way that is consistent with this God-given reconciliation. From this perspective, the church's continual practice of Eucharistic fellowship and shared citizenship through one baptism is the church's attempt to localize its experience of God's reconciliation in the world. It is through these practices that the church enacts the proclamation that the world is no longer to be divided along social, economic, and ethnic lines. It is in worship, then, that the church represents a conscious restructuring of human society, 
whereby wider social divisions are given way to a new, more fruitful way of ordering the political community. But Paul's words also contain a warning. When the Eucharist is practiced in such a way that fails to genuate genuine reconciliation, perhaps even working against it, or becomes a parody of itself, or where the actions performed at the altar do not flow out into the streets so that others may taste and see the reconciled life promised to them by Jesus, then the consumption of the body and blood ceases to be the Lord's Supper. It would be better, Paul writes, to not have communion at all. Such a warning tells us that the antidote to the problems facing our church and world is not simply to have more Eucharist, as if it possesses some automatic cure. Performing the actions of the Eucharist is not a substitute for discernment. Our worship, rather, must spring from a renewing of our minds and hearts as we seek to discern what is the will of God. Paul and the rest of the New Testament argue that this has already been answered for us in God's reconciliation of all creation through his son, Jesus. The task at hand is to recognize this reality and live accordingly.